I would like to call the November 18th, 2020 virtual meeting of the Fenton Community High School District 100 regular board meeting to order. May I have a roll call, Mary? Yes, Yalowick. I'm here. Peyton Howell. Here. Figueroa. Here. Rago. She, where'd she go? She stepped away <laughs> from the <my> computer. <laughs> Sorry, was you calling me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking for my readers. Um, here. <laughs> Ramirez. Yes. Ting Po Pong. Here. Wiedemann. Here. Okay, we have a uh, quorum. Um, could everyone please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, Republic which is in one nation, 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 nation under God, under God, under God, under God, under God and the for all. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, we are going to take a moment of silence for DJ Lash, a Fenton freshman who passed away this week. DJ was a person with a smile and spirit that ra radiated in every environment she entered. There are no words that can ad adequately express our deepest sorrow for the loss of DJ Lash. Please keep the, the Lash family in your thoughts and prayers. James, please read our Fenton Mission beliefs and Bison Way statements. He's on mute. Oh, yeah. James, Thanks, Mary. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our mission statement, cultivate uh, successful passionate learners through rigor, relevance, and relationships. Belief statement, successful passionate learners thrive when we champion innovative teaching and engaged learning. School and home collaborate effectively. We provide a safe, secure, and caring environment. We infuse social and emotional learning into academics and culture. Diversity empowers our, our learning community. We prepare students for civic duties. The Bison Way. Students and adults at Fenton High School create a safe, caring, empathetic environment where we believe in each other, respect diversity, communicate openly, grow together, and hold each other to high expectations to become the leaders and innovators of the future. Thank you, James. Uh, we move on to the board member appreciation, James. Sure. Board, I hope you know that we are truly appreciative of the work you are doing, especially during these challenging times uh, called, called COVID. Uh, we truly appreciate your support and resolve of our FEN priorities during the pandemic, which is three things, safety and wellness, learning and communication. You've also played a role in regards to making sure our students are fed and have inter internet connectivity. Also, our staff feel safe and supported. And lastly, our community is informed and supported via food and toy drives, safety information, connectivity resources. In addition, this board initiated and supported the strategic plan, portrait of a graduate, equity audit, the famous facility assessment, 
and exploring a possibility for a building referendum to name future major events. These are just a few things that you guys have no. spearheaded and led the district in. For this board, thank you, thank you. We appreciate you. All right, well, thanks, thanks so much, James. Um, now we move on to my favorite part, the student recognition. Uh, James, again, that's you. Yep, uh, real quick, we would like to recognize Fenton sophomore Victor Vasquez for qualifying for the state uh, in cross country. Uh, as you all know, due to COVID, there are no state competition this year. Okay, however, uh, we still want to celebrate Victor's hard work and dedication to the cross country team and to Fenton. Here is a video of Victor and his coaches, Coach Fritsch and Co Coach Erhart. Jim, take it away. We'd like to uh, thank the board for uh, honoring, honoring our state qualifier this year. It was a kind of a crazy year, but we were fortunate to get our season in. So we look forward to uh, the future that we have with our young athlete here. So without shorter. What happened? Yeah, what happened is right. It's a little bit laggy. We'd like to uh, we'd, like, we'd like to uh, thank the board for uh, honoring our state qualifier this year. It was a kind of a crazy year, but we were fortunate to get our season in. So we look forward to uh, the future that we have with our young athlete here. So without shorter, uh, without uh, uh, any less of an introduction, let me introduce our state qualifier, our state qualifier Victor Vasquez. Um, it was pretty fun. It was a pretty fun season, even though with all this pandemic going on. But I did want to thank everybody who participated, who I got along with, who I could go along and train with and race with. A lot of hard work and dedication by Victor this year over the summer. Uh, a lot of times he's out there running by himself, doing workouts. So he worked hard for what he got, and he's well deserved. Perfect. That's our Victor Sanchez qualifying again, once again for uh, state cross country. Okay, thank you. That very good, uh, James. Do we, do we have any requests for public comments? Yes, we do. We have eight. Okay, as a reminder, uh, public comments are limited to three minutes per speaker with a limited limit of 30 minutes uh, per topic. Uh, Superintendent Antenko will read the public comments uh, received in uh, chronological order. Uh, James, please. Sure. The following comments will be read and submitted. Uh, inappropriate words will be replaced with the word ex expletive. Okay, expletive. November 17th, uh, this is from Miss Rebecca Bohm. 
By now, you're probably sick of hearing from me. But as I watch COVID cases increase to record no record numbers day after day, it is becoming increasingly obvious that we will be comp uh, completing this semester and at least starting next semester with a, a remote learning schedule. It is even more important that we tweak the existing remote schedule to maximize our students' learning experience. We no longer need to adjust our schedule to cater a hybrid schedule. This is not happening anytime soon. We do need to ensure that our students are attending classes five days a week and going to school full time, just like other schools, this districts in the area are doing. I was speaking to a friend whose daughter attends Downers Grove South High School. Not only is she attending school five days a week, they require that students are dressed, not pajamas, and are sitting upright. She sees each of her teacher each day and participates in class then has homework, just like she was attending school in person. The story is similar from friends who, from high school students in Villa Park, Addison, Oak Park, and Oak Lawn. The students at Fenton deserves the same opportunities as these other students in this area have. I think every, everyone understands why we are keeping our students at home. What I don't understand is why our remote schedule is so significantly different than other schools in the area. As I have said before, I would like to see a revised remote schedule that reflects the Bell schedule. I would like to see classes offered on Mondays, and I would like to see the entire day, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., used for classes and group projects, just as it would be when students are learning in person. This is what other school schools in the area are doing, and that is what Fenton students deserve. Thank you for your time. Next one is um, common as a, from Talia Anguino. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am a graduate of Fenton's, uh, Fenton class of 2013. As a representative of the Fenton Advocacy Network to remind you all that our community is invested in the future of diversity, equity, and inclusion at Fenton. We will continue to reiterate our goals and demand until they are met. We will not stop until the board actively engages with the community to work to dismantle oppressive systems. You're, you are elected to not only represent us, but protect us, especially those who are marginalized for their gender and or race. We are the Fenton Advocacy Network. We are centered on advocacy for our tradition, traditionally marginalized students and education surrounding hate, bias, discrimination, and racism experience or witness at Fenton. To reverse this trend of inequity beginning on the board's level, we need open communication between the community and the board. Therefore, we will begin the conversation. As part of a future diversity action plan, we demand bullet point one, a recommendation of the approved diversity and equity statement to include different identities of students. The creation of a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee that includes students and community members. The implementation of mandatory diversity, equity, and inclusion training for all students and staff having regular diversity, equity, and inclusion workshops for students and staff, assembling de designated spaces for ma marginalized groups, hiring a counselor and mentor specifically for marginalized groups, analysis of trends in discipline, referral data, attendance and academic success, post media virtual and physically in support black and brown communities through both statements and pictures, creation of the, uh, creation a zero, zero tolerance policy for acts of discrimination, attending events and classes of your current students, scheduling speakers and authors of diverse background to speak, hosting a Q&A with the community, present your, uh, present your views and conduct a dialogue. Aside from other demands, we are inviting the board to work with us and be actively anti-racist and genuinely empathetic in the way that alumni and current students need. Your support is invaluable uh, to our mission. As part of the Fenton Advocacy uh, Network's goal, we have chosen to share stories with you that testify to the discrimination of all kinds of Fenton, past and present. We are asking you to open your hearts and put yourselves in these authors' shoes. Please realize that the authors behind these words are, are or were students who felt unsafe, silenced, and oppressed. These students' experiences are what you raised in your equity statement. We will be holding a future town hall over Zoom to continue the conversation. We are hoping you will be a part of the equity journey to make Fenton a more supportive and welcoming environment for all so that future Fenton graduates will not feel 
as though their misfortune is the product of our inaction. Thank you. The next public comment is from Jessica Bangle. The following stories are state are testaments regarding acts of discrimination witnessed or experienced at Fenton High School, which were collected by the Fenton Advocacy Network. In quotes, I was told I was in Ivy League materials by an adult working at Fenton. After I had been very vulnerable with my post high school plans, dreams, the adult then proceeded to tell that I would be better off just applying to a community college but later that week told me told a white male with a 3.2 average GPA to not limit himself and apply to an Ivy League, Ivy League he, uh, he chose. I am a Hispanic female with a 4.2 average GPA. I think out of everyone who knows me, I know myself and my, abil my, my abilities better. Submitted anonym anonymously, okay? Um, second paragraph, I, I had struggled with medic, medical issues and home issues through high school. My family had no money, and I wasn't sure if we would have a home for much longer. However, I worked hard to, to maintain my GPA. I heard such positive things about the staff members that assisted with, the, with college navigation. I decided to see her for assistance with my college applications and financial aid. I was told by her that I would never make make it in college, any college. I left her office feeling incredibly discouraged and doubted myself um, and my worth for a long time. I persevered. I am now a 4.0 college student, submitted anonymously. I met with a staff member to talk about college. I wanted to go to medical school and as I sat there uh, ranked high up in my class. She told me my best choice was to major in dance, submitted anonymously. I know a teacher in particular who basically cornered a student which is unprofessional and other teachers defended him. Whole time that student was having an anxiety attack and nobody made the effort to give her time to breathe and calm down, submitted anonymously. My teacher would, would tell me to smile more often because I'm a girl, submitted anonymously. I just come back to class after being gone for a few days at hospital. My teacher purposely called me to answer a question. He then proceeded to laugh in front of the class and say, oh, right, you weren't the hearer. He deliberately threw away my completed assignments while the out going boys around me got 100% on their assignments that were only partially incomplete, submitted anonymously. Um, the fourth public comment is from Jamie Menard. Um, the following stories are testaments regarding acts of discrimination witnessed or experienced at Fenton High School, which were collected by the Fenton Advocacy Network. I'm currently a junior. There is so much discrimination at Fenton, but people don't seem to realize it, especially in class or online through social media. It's, it's the way our class work and no, no one seems to be, to be a big deal out of it when it really is. I don't know the, the faculty. Could you turn that off, Ms. Timmons? We just started. I don't think the faculty Fenton understand the, the amount of discrimination that happened at Fenton either. I'll hear students be disrespected and you use social slurs every day to the point where it's normalized. I've been called certain things that make me uncomfortable. People referring to me as certain things slash people. Some kids use the R slur as well as the F slur. People are so judgmental too. People like to discriminate against the LGBT community. Personally, it makes me upset as I am an ally to the community, which is why I'm writing this right now, submitted anonymously. I was on the speech team for four years. I always chose scripts for events that were close to my heart in my Asian culture. One coach would try to steer me away from scripts like these and chose scripts that were more 
universal. One time a dog was in one script and they asked, are all Asian people afraid of dogs? Submitted, submitted anonymously. As a parent with two black students at Fenton, at, at Fenton students, I believe that there are in it, uh, inequities in the representation of students of color. There is a need for desegregated curriculum and commitment to diversity, the teaching staff submitted Dr. Sunal Lewis. The amount of Muslim terrorist jokes I have heard since I have started at Fenton High School is uncountable, submitted anonymously. It's hard to really be yourself at school when everyone has an opinion and shares it. It's hard to know where you fit in, in because you can't see past all the bullying and homophobia at our school. I think it's really unfortunate that our world has come to this. I honestly feel more comfortable with e-learning because I don't have to worry about being called names in the hallway. I don't have to worry about anyone taking pictures and sending them around the school. I don't have to worry about anyone sharing their thoughts on who I decide to be, to be with, submitted anonymously. Uh, this next one is from Xavier Pete. Uh, the following stories are testaments regarding acts of discrimination witnessed or experienced at Fenton High School, which were collected by the Fenton Advocacy Network. I am a trans guy and a peer refuses to, to gender me correctly because he agrees with everything name of a person says. I was sick of this. And the people like this only care about expl expletive. I told him I have a expletive to which he responded, one would have to see it or believe it, which he, which is clearly implying that he must see expletive order for me to be a man, which is incredibly creepy also upon asking clarification. So you are asking me uh, expletive. Uh, he replied with not my words, but interpreted how you wish. On other occasion, his mockingly made assuming gender pronoun jokes and his best friends thinks that gay people only make up 1% of the population and therefore do not deserve rights, which the peer presumably agrees with, submitted, submitted anonymously. As a male part of the LGBTQ community last year, I was a freshman and was going to start gym second semester right before changing for my gym was in place. I got asked by a staff member if I would like to change in the nurse's office. I knew the reason why was because some males didn't feel comfortable with me in the dressing room. At first, I didn't understand why, but, but I said yes to changing in the nurse's office. Then later on, I realized the reason on why submitted anonymously. Although I never had a, any specific instances, I always felt like outside of a, of a few spaces, I had no place to be able to truly express and figure out my non-binary identity. It took me going to college and becoming an officer for the Pride Alliance to even realize I wasn't cis. I know people who weren't allowed to be able to use bathrooms or locker rooms that they were comfortable with. I always wonder why I felt so weird in the women's locker room. Hint, it's because I'm non-binary. I don't fit in the mold of gender, and I never felt the room to express that at Fenton, submitted Jupiter. I had a couple of friends afraid to come up because other students usually make jokes that refer to them as expletive or really feminine or expletive. It may... It made it really hard for them to feel uh, welcome because these jokes always held a negative connotation submitted anonym anonymously. We ask not to infer any motivation of any firsthand accounts shared by the Fenton Advocacy Network other than a willingness to share nor infer the identity of any individuals. These are not intended to be accusatory or reflect bias, rather to reflect greater Fenton experience of the contributors. contributors. Uh, number six, sixth comment. This is from Mr. Marshall Subak. 
Fenn Board of Education members. This is Marshall Subak. This year, Fenn canceled PSAT tests for juniors due to the pandemic. Each year, Fenton juniors take the PSAT in October. For those board members who had children that graduated from Fenton, your child took the PSAT at Fenton at junior, as junior. PSAT was given to juniors in October by many of the surrounding high schools. It can be done and done safely. Why not at Fenton? Uh, Fenton provided the SAT in October to seniors with no known problems or COVID outbreak. The good news is that College Board has given an alternative of January 26, 21 uh, for when Fenton can give the PSAT to juniors. Why is this important? The PSAT is important because it is how students become eligible to the, uh, for the National Merit Scholars and become eligible for certain scholarship. There are specific scholarships for African-Americans, Hispanic, and Latino students that students become eligible for, for by taking the PSAT as a junior. As a board, you are looking to, uh, at equity and fairness for all students. Canceling the PSAT and not rescheduling it goes directly to equity and fairness. I am asking you to do the right thing uh, for all students and have a chance to be a National Merit Scholars and those students that need scholarships to go on to college to make a motion and direct administration to the host of PSAT at Fenton on January 26, 2020. The board has the authority to do this. It's in, it is a policy decision. We have plenty of smart, highly paid people offending who can probably plan and figure out how to give the taste safely for juniors on January 26, 2021. As for the remote learning plan, it, it's time to pivot. As I said before, there is not enough instructional time with the teachers. The teachers have to take some responsibility for this problem as well. They can advocate for a better remote plan. There's been absolutely no data to show that the current plan is working. The staff has done survey to staff, parents and students but no measurable data on how much the student's learning and comprehension is behind. This learning gap has to be measured by the teachers and reported back to the board. The administration and the teachers have to start planning now as how, how are the students going to make up any gaps in, in learning and comprehension. Thank you. The seventh public comment is from Patrick Escobar. Escobedo. Escobedo, I'm sorry, thank you so much. Um, Patrick Escobedo, uh, President Wiedemann and members of the board. My name is Patrick Escobedo and I come before you tonight to say greetings and happy Thanksgiving from the FEA. Uh, during the unprecedented year we are having, it is more important than ever to consider that for which we are thankful and the FEA is very thankful for, the, for our students. For the FEA, working with our student has been a saving grace from the isolation that COVID has brought about. They have kept us connected to them and each other, and they have helped see us through the most trying period. The deep purpose we find in educating our students has taken on a new meaning this year, and it has reaffirmed our strong desire to keep them in a safe and loving place for them to learn. We ask that the board to join in the community by affirming this, the safety and inclusion of all our students in Fenton, especially our students of color, LG, BTQ plus students, undocumented students, and students from mixed status families. The board's affirmation to this and would send a strong message of love and support to the very students who are the reason we are all here tonight. In addition to being especially grateful for our students this year, the FEA is also very thankful to be able to deliver our message to you tonight. Communication is perhaps that which both makes us human and makes civilization possible. It is what allows for creativity, innovation, and healing. Our ability to communicate can bring us together and allow us to share our hopes and dreams. But communication has two essential components, those that deliver the message and those that receive it. Month after month, year after year, our association, concerned parents, and empower, empowered current and former students have come before the board with impassionate pleas, calls for understanding, and challenges to be, to be the leaders we all know you can be. And disappointingly, we have... All, all been met with the same well silence. It's hurt. It hurts to bring before the school board an issue about which you feel strongly about, which you are worried and about which you care and to receive no response. The lack of response therefore becomes the response and one which sends the message that your words don't matter. I know the board does not want to send such a message to its constituents, stakeholders, and students. I therefore call upon the board to break this practice by taking time to follow up with those that submitted public comments in an authentic and substantial manner. Please know I am not asking the board to engage with everyone who makes a comment. 
during the meeting, but rather to reach out to the uh, reach out with a phone call or an email after a meeting uh, to validate the concern expressed and to honor the time and energy taken to express them. This act would send a powerful message of inclusion and care to all those who come before you to speak. Concerned parents, the uh, Fitna Advocacy Network, current students, teachers, and staff members, all of those who make up the Fitna community. In closing, thank you on behalf of the FEA for the opportunity to address the board, and we look forward to hearing from you soon. Happy Thanksgiving, Patrick Escobedo, FEA president. Our last public comment is from Omar Marin. In regards to the equity task force and equity uh, in general, I think this equity task force is great first step in trying to fill the holes Fenton has been in regards to equity. However, to the boards and any member of this task force listening, I must stress the importance of actually listening to the correct people about the correct things. When it comes down to making decisions for the population that do not feel welcome at Fenton, the perspective and suggestions of the people that can speak from their uh, identity and firsthand ex experiences hold all the value as opposed to someone who cannot. For example, when discussing or enacting any plans to ameliorate the environment for the, for the Latin American community of Fenton, the voices and perspective of people like my old Matt, old Matt staff name from Little Village, I might add, should never be questioned by the likes of someone who cannot identify with the population ex, ex a white peer. Uh, the same could be said about the LGBTQ and staff member name being the voice who, who holds value over others. I only stress this uh, because it's bound to happen. One white teacher on the task force told my Mexican friends that they do not feel safe while they, they attend Fenton last year. You guys tell me if I'm supposed to think someone like that has the best interests of people that looks like me. Additionally, I would like to, do, to mention that the potential of implementing SEL lessons centered on racism and homophobia, transphobia during the bison time. I was a senior mentor last year, and I can say from personal experience that there, it, there is more than enough room to squeeze a lesson or two on how to identify these problems, support victims, and addressing the, the problems as a whole. It's clearly a big problem at the school per people who have attended, and the tools are already set in place. Lastly, it's pretty obvious you guys should be reaching out to the people of these populations, members of the community, things like that. Real change will be, will be minimal if no one, no one reaches out to the actual people that are affected by the current environment. If the dialogue remains between administrators and members of the board, you guys will not be serving an under, underrepresented community. You will merely be working in one. So that is the end of the public comment. All right, thank you, James. Um, on behalf of the board, I would like to thank Rebecca, Talia, Jessica, Jamie, Xavier, Marshall, Patrick, and Omar for their comments. Um, thank you for your comments, and we re really appreciate the time you took to uh, prepare these uh, comments. I would also like to reiterate and make it clear that each, each and every board member here is unequivocally committed to and, ha and has always embraced inclusion, diversity, and equity for LGBTQ students of color, undocumented students, and low-income students, and students with uh, disabilities here at Fenton High School. Um, and then also regarding the PSAT, PSAT will take place on January 26th as planned. Again, thank you to all who uh, submitted their comments. Um, now we move on to the consent agenda. Uh, do we have any questions and or comments regarding the consent agenda? President Wiedemann, we will need to go over the District 100 informational items first. You skipped an item. I'm sorry, you are right. I see that right here. Then let's move, I'm sorry, let's do the, yeah. If you can uh, take that, James. Absolutely. 100 informational items. That happens to me all the time as well. Um, 
we have four items here. Uh, we're going to do a COVID-19 up uh, update, uh, followed by a learn our learning plan, then our equity reports, uh, and this time it will be restorative justice with our deans, and our RAMP, RAMP presentation by our assistant principal, Mrs. Roberts. So first up here real quick, uh, COVID update. Um, you guys know this. You, 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 there's a COVID surge, right? It's, it's the second wave. Uh, it is not good. Uh, the numbers are concerning. Uh, and once again, it's not good. As a reminder uh, to the board, I meet weekly with the DuPage County Public Health Department and twice a week with the DuPage superintendent. So we're all informed. We're all listening from the scientists and the experts. Uh, we discuss the health metrics and other COVID related topics during our meeting. Now let's look at some numbers here real quick. Next slide, please. This first slide is the new COVID death updates up 260% since October 1st. This is alarming. This is a concern. Um, you can see that it's, it's projected to go upwards um, um, in, in, in a couple months if we don't slow it down, if communities do not slow it down and take action. COVID, if you don't know, COVID-19 is now the third leading cause of the United States. Uh, heart disease and cancer being number one and two, uh, respectively. Next slide, please. Along with the numbers of deaths, hospitalization uh, numbers are also concerning. Hospital beds are important. Uh, it has surpassed uh, the hospitalization numbers uh, in Illinois last spring. Um, you've heard the governor um, and, and the experts there that this is truly a concern. If you haven't heard of the Mayo Clinic, and I, I believe it's in Euclid, Wisconsin, they're out of beds there already. So this is a con concern for Illinois. These are the things that we talk about at our meetings. Next slide, please. If the trend continues, okay, um, uh, uh, hospitalization and ICU uh, occupancy could be five times higher than the spring wave. So we have to keep an eye on that. I'll continue to uh, to report on this. Um, and you know, as you know, the state will take necessary action if they have to, and that could be uh, we don't know yet. Uh, more mitigation and uh, possibility of of a, of a shutdown. Um, you've seen this slide before. Uh, now we're tra transitioning. That was the state data that was presented. Now we're going to DuPage. This is basically the DuPage County COVID-19 school metrics that all schools look at here in DuPage. All six metrics, all six metrics on the right-hand side are in red. This is the second week in a row that it's in red. What does it mean when it's in red? That shows it's substantial transmission, com community transmission in our community. That is not good. OK, that's the highest level there. Uh, the first row, if you go across Illinois Department of Public Health, county level risk, we're at we're at substantial. That's the highest level. Second row, it says new cases per 100,000 per week. That's individuals. We're at 429 people per 100,000 per week. If you don't remember a, a month ago when I used to present this to you, we were at 50, 75. It was hard for us to break 100. So you're looking at quadrupling. Of, of these numbers. The third column, it says weekly case counts per trend. Um, week, we have been taking, DuPage Public Health Department has been taking data for 44, 45 weeks now. And if uh, the first line there says from week 43 to 44, an increase of 40% of case count uh, of cases. Week 44 to 45, which is this week, it's up 37%. Now let's look at the youth rate, the next row there, under 19, week 43 to 44, 55% increase. Week 44 and 45, once again, this week, it's up 69%, okay? Weekly test positivity, uh, for one time we were in the 15% here, 12.8 um, as of yesterday, um, again, red. In our neighboring uh, counties, are, are also insubstantial. Next slide, please. Now we're gonna drill down a little bit so you have the data here. This one is COVID-19 cases per youth group, basically from zero to 19 years old. It's obvious there that our, the red and green are leading the chart there. You see the spike. All the youths are moving up. That's the trend there, as you can see, is a nice, almost a parabola there going up. Uh, our, our five to 14 and 15 to 19 leads the number there. Okay, next slide, please. Another way to look at it is a bar bar graph there. Far right, the highest one is our 15 to 19. That would be our high school students, followed by the middle um, 
bar graph there, that would be our middle schoolers. So how does it look like for all age group from zero to 80 plus there? What's the trend? It's obvious there, it's all going up, right? Across all age groups. Leading the way from here, tiny graph there is the 20 to 39, the blue line, followed by, I believe that's a yellow 40 to 59, okay? Then you see the youth behind there. Next slide, please. This is COVID cases by municipalities. Uh, uh, Bensonville is at 1241, okay? Number 11 on the chart. Um, we're, we're not in the top 10, but we're number 11. And Wooddale is 737 on the lower end, 737 COVID cases. Next slide, please. Due page as a whole, uh, by date, uh, the daily test positivity. There it is. Um, uh, yeah. 11, 15, 12.4%, the 14th of November, 14% uh, and so forth. Uh, so the numbers are way over where we want it. We want it underneath five. This is way over five. Um, we're averaging about 13%. Next slide, please. Let's drill down some more to our own community. This is Wooddale. Wooddale right now is about 17%, okay, uh, COVID uh, positivity rate. Next slide, please. Let's look at Bensonville. Bensonville is hovering between 19 and 18 percent higher than Wooddale. Okay, this is alarming. Okay, this is alarming. Not good numbers. Okay, so how are DuPage County High Schools in our Upstate Eight Conference? Upstate Eight is our sport conference. Where are they at right now? Uh, let's look at the the majority are in uh, are in remote District 87, Glenbard with four high school. It's in remote. District 88 with two high schools in remote. Uh, District 94, West Chicago. District 99, Downers. There's two high schools there. Fenton, obviously. Lake Park, Elmers. Why did I put U46? Because they're part of our, uh, our conference. They have five high schools also in remote and East Aurora. Um, it goes without saying, District 2 and 7, our middle school feeders are also in remote. Next slide, please. Winter sport, okay. IHSA has paused winter sports, uh, uh, which includes, um, let me see if I can remember, uh, uh, basketball, bowling, gymnastics, cheer, dance. I believe that's it. Okay, they put a pause on it. What does a pause mean? That means no practices, no competition. Just as an FYI board, our Upstate 8 conference canceled basketball prior to the IHSA uh, pause. As you know, you read in the newspaper, there's some back and forth between IHSA, the governor, IDPH as well. So right now, we believe it's going to be canceled. We want sports to happen, but it's got to be done in a safe way, possibly later down, down spring uh, uh, at a later time. Tier three mitigation. Uh, when you hear the word mitigation board, that really applies to businesses. Okay, does it not apply to school? Tier three mitigation starts on Friday, 1201. As the governor uh, stated, it, can, uh, it includes retail, personal care, service, health and fitness, hotels, manufacturing, bars and restaurants, meeting areas, social events, gathering, recreational activities, theaters, casinos, cultural institute. And again, does not apply to schools. And lastly there, DuPage County Public Health recommends remote learning at this time. Next slide, please. So what does that mean for Fenton? What is our learning plan? Five things to report here. Uh, due to the COVID surge and recommendation from the DuPage Public Health Department, Fenton will remain in remote learning for at least the remainder of the semester. Number two, we will continue to allow very small groups of students to enter the building for support because they need support. You guys know that. That's our ESL, our special ed, students that have connectivity, uh, or Wi-Fi issues, ninth grade on track, engagement, supervised remote learning, and tutoring. We will Number three, we'll continue to work with, with our remote and hybrid task force um, in regards to more contact time um, that we'll try to pivot to uh, second semester. Number four, we will continue planning for students to return to hybrid second semester. As you guys heard uh, in the news, there's vaccines from Pfizer, um, um, and another um, biotech group, I think it's called Moderna, 
underway, but that's months away from mass distribution, but we need to continue to plan for that. How will that look like? Um, parents, w would they rather second semester uh, be remote or, or hybrid? We're, but we're gonna take it, we're gonna chunk it, we're gonna make sure it's safe uh, to return to our school. And number five, most importantly, we're gonna continue to monitor health department metrics and advisories. I will pause there real quick. If you could go back, Jim, please, and give a chance for the board to just soak this in. I know that was so, that was a lot of data. I could have put more data. I limited myself to 10 slides. Uh, so you have that, uh, you see that all the time. I'm sure you guys listen to the news, but I just want to make sure it's thorough. So I went global, all US, Illinois, DuPage, our municipalities here, and Fenton High School. And once again, thank for the board. I mean, it's, it's, it's safety has to come first. You guys reiterate that over and over, and I'm, I'm glad you guys are, are solid with that, resolving the, the, the priority for our school district. Can I ask a question about number three? Sure. Okay. Um, so there's there's been talk about like increasing the amount of um, student teacher time. Is that still, is that in the works? Yes, yes, Patty. That is definitely work. I know Yovan and Michelle are working very hard with both the remote and hybrid task force to make that a reality. Uh, Principal Lazarevich, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, uh, we've you. talked to our teachers and uh, there are so obviously some that are um, concerned about contact time and there are others that feel that the contact time is, is, uh, is good. So we're going to try and balance that and make sure that, uh, you know, we're not overwhelming with screen time and, and make sure that we have um, students in there. So, you know, obviously uh, uh, the first thing we think of is that this is a pandemic. And so that's what we work from. So, I mean, it's not a, you know, this is an in-person learning where we have that opportunity. So we, we want to make sure that, that we're, we're mindful of everything and empathetic as we, uh, as we make some of these schedules and make some of these changes. So, um, you know, the other piece too, Mr. Antango, if I can say it's, you know, I, I think I said this before, this isn't about, you know, you can't just pivot and go in a different direction. There's 1400 kids, 200 staff members, you know, families, communities that, that look at certain schedules. And so we have to make sure that we take everything into account and not just, um, and not just move uh, all, right away because it's 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 not that easy to do. Uh, with like turning an aircraft carrier, as I like to say, um, you know, you don't want to turn it too quickly, or five thousand sailors are going to get sick real quick. So we, we need to make sure that we're um, we're balancing that, and that's what we're doing. And Ms. Papa Nicolau and her work with Highlander has been fantastic in in uh, segregating the data and, and making sure that we're heading in the right direction. So. Could I ask a question? Um, I'm sorry, uh, I had to cut out of the last board meeting because I wasn't feeling well. Was that something that was discussed? Was it, uh, sorry, I, I hit the button again. Was that something that was discussed at the last boarding, board meeting that there was a possibility of adding uh, more teacher student time or? The Yes, Julius, I think that's been a co constant communication that there is a um, concern that, that are, there's enough, not enough contact time with the teachers face to face synchronous learning. Well, that was well, the right, last I two. Know that, but I, uh, yes, I understand that. But I, so that's just something that you guys have been uh, discussing and with the possibility of adding if it's advantageous. Yes. And, and then yes. with the teachers union yes. and, and if it's okay of course yeah i mean uh, the collaboration yes. is i mean this is not a top-down decision um we're obviously looking at the surveys that come in and we're taking a look at it and and we're looking at other schools uh you know many of them are not going every single period of the day um it's just too much screen time as we go um, mr on tango is obviously he's twice a week with superintendents dealing with this Ms. Papa Nicola, I'll meet several times. Uh, I, I meet several times a week with other principals from other buildings. So this is a constant conversation. No, nobody has it figured out. There's, you know, there's classes that are running 25 minutes, 30 minutes for some areas. Um, you know, we're going six, it's almost 60 minutes um, 
uh, in, in some areas, very, very few schools, if any, are, are actually going every single day with every single period. Um, cause again, it's, it's just too long of a period of time for screen time. I mean, you, this is the current anecdotal data. If you take a look out there, when you look under education pieces, uh, uh, the leadership uh, articles that we keep getting, keep telling us about, you know, making sure that with screen time, and it's not just for students, it's for staff too. Um, you know, I, I, I like sharing the story about my wife. I mean, my wife's a teacher and, and eight, nine hours a day on that screen. And, and, and it's, you know, it's taxing. Um, so, you know, we want to make sure that we're empathetic, you know, and, and, and as I, as I like to point out, oftentimes when I have these conversations is it's a pandemic. <laughs> we're trying to make sure that, that we, you know, that we engage our students and make sure that they're healthy and safe. Um, but we obviously care about, about their education. We want to make sure that we're going forward, but everybody is in the same boat. There are millions of kids that are in remote learning right now. Um, so, it, it, you know, this isn't just a Fenton issue. This is a, this is a national worldwide issue that we're, that we're constantly dealing with. And we're gathering as much information as we can. And we know more now than we did in June and July when we created this. And, and you know, we're going to keep looking at these and we're going to, you know, we have focus groups that are going on right now that Ms. Papanicola has been doing. So, yeah, it's definitely something that we want to make sure that we maintain. But we also want to be mindful that, you know, we don't have headaches and all these other things and, and have staff that are calling in sick because they're on the computer for um, numerous periods of time as well. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're definitely, you know, we, we've heard our staff and we've heard, um, you know, some, the, you know, the, the data uh, is there and we're, we're definitely going to try and work in some more contact time, uh, some more meaningful contact time. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Good question. I was just thinking about this, and yeah, I think I think you guys are are definitely doing your best as far as the situation and uh, and working with what we have. But I think maybe in terms of, and I would propose this and see what the board thinks. So, would it be possible or realistic if you look at this strategically and you think about? you know, the, the time we've had to work this remote 2.0 process. Um, and you guys help me out here, administration-wise, Yovan. Are we in, still in the data collecting stage? Or are we also collecting data, analyzing it, identifying areas of improvement or problems we might be able to identify as be able to fix it? And then maybe working towards that. I understand the ramifications with, you know, you've got a complex issue here, but what's the problem solving process that we have right now? So for example, we've talked about uh, screen time. We've talked about, um, uh, you know, contact teachers, but analyzing the data, collecting it, right? We'll collect and analyzing it and identifying areas where we can actually move towards making this remote point 2.0 better. I'll uh, off, you'll, you'll buy. Okay, go ahead. Yep, and, and you can fill it in. I think we've been doing that, uh, Kit, um, starting from the spring, right? Uh, we made sure we had a survey right after that spring semester. That's how 2.0 was created. Um, we, we, and we collected data both from students, parents, and teachers. Uh, as you remember, they wanted grades back, the grades are back. They wanted more uh, uh, structured time. They need time to communicate with, with parents and students. They wanted more communication with at home, more support service. And that's how the, the 2.0 was created. I mean, data, you're always, you're, you always want feedback, right? But you also got to sort and filter that feedback. Is that like what Yovan was saying? Is it, it's November, right? Is it, is it really logistic to, 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 to pivot? Uh, like I reported, the remote and hybrid task force continue to meet to to fine tune what we have. This is the first time we've ever done this. As, as Giovanni continues to hit with, with the pandemic, this is the, we're all first year teachers. We're all first year board members in regards to the pandemic, and feedback is critical. We sort it. We work with the with the individuals, our teachers, our support staff that that uh, that work with our students on a on a daily basis. So we do pay, uh, uh, we do look at our data. We look at this at the solutions as a collective, like you know, not top down. Hey, look, what are you listening? What are you guys hearing in the classroom? What are you hearing, division leaders, and so forth? So that's how we solve these issues. Go ahead, Principal Zarevich. 
Uh, thanks, Mr. Antigo. I Yes, um, I, I think we're, we're we're all of the above. We're collecting data. We're analyzing data. We're we're trying to sort it into the correct buckets to make sure that we're making good decisions. We're looking at problems of practice. We're looking at cycles of inquiry as terms of, you know, what is our root cause for some of the things that are going on. I mean, these are our normal practices during um, during in person learning when we have every single kid in the building, but. It's even more important now to make sure we're looking at that. The, the problem that we that we run into now is that there's no research out there in terms of what does remote long term remote learning look like. Uh, so we're we're just trying to make sure that we can get the pedagogy out there and make sure that our teachers are engaging. And and I will tell you that you know I w I was in classrooms early on in you know uh, in the school year in late August, early September, and I've been in classrooms the last couple of weeks as well. I mean, I, all throughout the time, and I know Ms. Pop Nickel, our division leaders have been doing this as well. And what it looked like in August is not what it looks like right now in November. I mean, it, it's very different. The engagement is very different. I mean, our, our teachers are, are working with, I, I was just in a, a U.S. history class the other day, and, um, and they're looking at Padlet maps, and they're, you know, I mean, and the kids are, I mean, it, it's flowing from the kids. They're like, oh, yeah, I also found this National Geographic map that's really cool, you know. I mean, it, it's the, it's, I, I would almost want to say collaboration partnership is even greater sometimes with what's going on and, the, and, and our teachers do such a great job of building relationships that the students are comfortable with that. So kind of back to your question, yeah, we're constantly analyzing this. Unfortunately, some of it is anecdotal data. Um, you know, they're, you know, looking at, uh, you know, I made a joke, uh, you know, with uh, somebody that said, you know, are, are we looking at the, at the um, success data, you know, and, and I kind of made a joke like, well, yeah, we don't have the 1918 success data from the last pandemic, so we can, can't see kind of what that looked like, so we can apply it here, um, you know, because, you know, I, I like to be cheeky occasionally on so, stuff like that, but, you know, we are constantly looking at data. We're looking at students uh -huh. and trying to figure out, <laughs> trying to figure out how to, how, how to find success within our students, and that's what they're doing. Uh, you know, their concern is, is very real about some of these students and, and we're uh, as an institution are doing some things and I have to tell you our teachers are, are, are there in the weeds with those kids and really, really working hard to make sure that our students are, are successful. So I kind of made it long winded, but we are looking at every aspect I and mean, we are collecting data and, and trying to analyze it and, um, you know, whether it's anecdotal or actually on a Likert scale, trying to figure out, you know, where that fits. And, uh, and this Papa Nicolau is, has done such a great job with, you know, and getting this Highlander Institute, which has been huge in, in breaking down because, you know, when you get 1,200 kids that are have anecdotal data and are telling us stories and they're breaking it down by themes, it's it's really you know for um you know for our admin team, it's that you know we're we're small to that. We're trying to deal with other COVID issues and they're breaking it down and telling us how the students you know what the students are saying. It's been really really uh, helpful for us and it's allowed us to to try to 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 move this ship a little bit to make sure that we're uh, we're meeting all of our students. And again, the longer we do it, this the better and better we're going to continue to be. And you know our next uh, schedule that you're going to, you know, that we're working on right now, you know, you're going to see kind of some similarities between the hybrid and the in-person, and you're going to see, uh, you know, some contact time, but you're also going to see professional development time because it's still important. And you're going to see, you know, social emotional learning time, which is still important for our students. So um, we're, we're trying to maintain those fundamentals, but yet still make sure that there's, you know, valuable contact time as we go forward. I just like to add to it. I let uh, Mrs. Papanicolo talk real quick. Just some concrete example of how you pivot, how you resolve issues. Look, there was a, that's why we have like what I just reported: small group support, special ed. That's solving an issue. Our connectivity, solving a, a, a particular issue. Our ELL, solving a certain need for those for those students. Um, our our students that have issues with uh, uh, engagement solving an, another issues that you know as things come as things come we solve we look at the data and resolve this uh, supervised remote learning is is the latest tutoring uh after school at night school is another solve so it's not like okay you let the ship go and let it go and watch it go down the horizon no you got to continue to pedal and steer that that ship to move forward go ahead miss papa nicola no, I think you guys both covered it well. Kit, to answer, uh, yes. Um, yes, we're, we're beyond the collecting phase and into the analysis and problem solving phase, but the collecting phase doesn't end, right? Like it's cyclical, so we continue. I think that's just what James and Yovan have been saying. We're already into our next round of collection through focus group. 
Um, and we have our next design meeting with um, Highlander Institute where they've broken down the data and we're gonna now um, you know, consider our next design shifts and tweaks. Um, you know, so we're already into a second round of problem solving design. Um, and we'll have another one in January and another one. So it, it, it's cyclical, it continues to happen. The collection, the analysis, the problem solving, the solution. So, you know, I think we'll see um, some adjustments to file schedules like we've talked about. Um, you know, we see other types of adjustments within the classroom and then we see other types of adjustments within our systems of support. So there's adjustments happening in all the various sectors of our organization and, and within our plan. So just keep working at it and um, keep listening. That's the key here is we're trying to find more and more ways to listen and listen really closely to our stakeholders and our students and our teachers. They're the ones that are doing the hard work on this and the parents at home. You know, they're, they're more. Uh... Okay, she froze there. I wanted to say something. I wanted to say something too. Um, my uh, my son's chiropractor. Her daughter goes to Lake Park, and I just wanted to compliment our school a little bit. And I'm not saying that we don't have work that we need to do because I think you know all schools do, but they have the so-called uh, you know going to going to every single class you know where they are supposed to follow their schedule and. But that's not really working very well for them, you know, because, you know, you're following your schedule, but still her daughter has three hours in the middle of the day where she has absolutely nothing going on. So she's got lunch and then she's got study hall and then she's got gym. So she's sitting there for three hours with absolutely nothing to do. And on top of that, she's got teachers that will just say, guess what? We're not having class today. So I don't know how that's happening in that school, but she'll have teachers just say, yep, you're not doing class today. So, you know, no school is perfect. And, and you might hear, you know, from other people, oh, well, my school's doing, you know, every day, you know, following an everyday schedule. But n no school is perfect, no matter what you're hearing. You know, there's always something. So, you know, and I'm not in, certainly not saying that that we don't have work to do because I think every school does. But I'm just saying that yeah. how you're following your following a uh, uh, schedule that you would do normally in school is not all it's cracked up to be either. I don't think from listening to what she's saying. So I don't know. You know. I just wanted to thanks, Julia. Um, I, I, the reason why I asked is is really to shed light on, I think, the, the challenges and, and obstacles and the circumstance that every school, including ours, is in. And to, to I think, to recognize and acknowledge that, um, you know, we're by far not in normal times. Right. And, um, and that... Every school, including ours, you know, with with our staff, with Mr. Antenko, with uh, Ms. Papadiklau, uh, Mr. Lazarovic, that um, you know, it, it takes leadership and the coordination of all stakeholders, right? And yep. you know, the data is being collected, the process is evolving. Um, you know, th the situation externally with our, um, you know, with COVID with our economic situation uh, around our community. There, there's a lot going on. It's a complex evolving issue. And so I, I just wanted to make sure that when we talk about this, that we really put things in perspective so that, you know, the, the general public, our students, everybody involved that maybe is involved in watching this understands how un abnormal this is and how uh, I think everybody here is doing their best to, to try to accommodate uh, the, the final goal, which is uh, to provide good education, but first with safety and health in mind. Is that fair? That is very fair. And if I could end with this, we are working really hard to what we have. We're very proud of our you know, We're making it better. Like what I said over and over, remote and hybrid task force, which is the groups that will make these better, will continue to evolve to have a great product here, to have a great service for our students. Now, I'm going to foreshadow it. When hybrid kicks in, we're going to be in the same boat again. All right. So our response will be the same. We've never been in hybrid. 
Okay, we're going to collect data. That's cyclical collect, do, and act, and collect some more. We're, that's going to go into effect once we get in hybrid as well. So if I could end with that, uh, again, uh, our, our, our staff, our teachers are doing an outstanding job, and I just want to give a shout-out to the administrators who are here day, day in and day out working long hours to make this possible for our, our, our community. Um, to that, I just wanted to add that, as I recall, in the summer when 2.0 was being unveiled and rolling out, and I, I remember the part of the discussion was that it was never really, even though it was a, a final product, it was never really going to be a final product because of the, all the reasons that everyone, board members and ad administration discussed, because this is the first time we're all going uh, at this, and that it was, it was going to be a constant tweaking or refining of, of, uh, of, of how education was going to work. And so just, you know, I just wanted to make it clear that, you know, the way I, I see, see remote learning working is that just because there is refinement going on, just because there is, uh, uh, it's getting amended and, and retweaked, that doesn't mean that the initial product that was out there was wrong or wasn't working, but that it had to start from some point. And for the most part, I think it has been, yeah, that it has been very successful again, due to everyone's commitment, both the teachers and administration and all the stakeholders, and that just because something gets retweaked, it's because we're, we are, to everybody's point, we, we are all learning from this. And I think uh, uh, everyone's commitment in this is, is, uh, is very evident. Thank you. Our next up uh, topic uh, for the info uh, informational item is our equity report. Um, uh, so far, um, we have presented uh, reports that incorporated equity in our professional development, PD, with our teachers and staff, finances, how do we support equity through finances, that was shared by, by Mr. Martin, uh, student clubs by Principal Lazarevich, and the curriculum by Mrs. Papa Nicolau. Uh, this evening, uh, we're going to present an uh, equity report in regards to restorative justice. Um, you'll hear, as you know, you, you probably heard in the news and in some of the literatures that we provided you, you know, that school to prison pipeline, right? Um, that's another something that we really got to take seriously um, and ask our question, why are our um, are, 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 are student of color being suspended much more uh, than, than other groups and so forth? So our dean has really... Uh, took the leadership role, and um, basically, in short, hey, look, we have to we have to dean in a different way. Okay, it's about the students, it's about relationship, and um, they prepared a 10 minute, 11 minute video to talk about restorative justice and how uh, it is definitely a lens towards equity. Jim, take it away, please. Good evening, everyone. This is Pedro Castro and Jason Madel, deans over at Fenton High School. We want to talk with you this evening about FHS's restorative justice equity journey. Before we go into the journey, just wanted to give you an overview of our presentation. We'll be talking about some background data, some background, some data, and some research. Uh, we'll talk about what is restorative justice, how does restorative justice look at Fenton. We're also going to illustrate our equity journey through the use of restorative justice practices. Before we go into the actual presentation, I would like for you to consider this. The Alliance for Education published a report in 2013 which indicated a ninth grader who is suspended once increase, increases in times more likely to drop out. So in other words, if a ninth grader is suspended from school one time, he increases the ability for that student to drop out of school from 16 to 32%. A second suspension for that ninth grader increases the risk of dropping out from 16 to 42%. So for this reason, we think about alternatives to suspension. We wanna be able to keep students in the building when it's safe and when it's doable. So um, here you have some statistics for Fenton discipline, Fenton discipline over the last nine years from 2010 through 2019. I do wanna highlight, which is highlighted there for 16 and 17 school year, 
In January of 2016, Senate Bill 100 went into effect. Although we started implementing some of Senate Bill 100 requirements, in although we started 2016, um, it was fully implemented, uh, at least the requirements of the, the bill in 2016 and 2017. Hey, Jim, can you hear me? Is so there any way that you're always going to explain yeah. what is that? So we here at Senate Bill is a traditional discipline system that was rooted in rules-based, uh, punitive, managerial, authoritative approach. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. That did not incorporate student input in terms of writing a wrong. I did want to make a distinction between student input here and student, student input in as it relates to due process. When we talk about due process, students are in the dean's office for uh, a violation of a school policy or a violation of something that has not gone um, well or didn't go as a student planned. So we want student input uh, as far as learning what happened, their point of view. That's due process. This student input talks more about righting a wrong. We want students to be involved in the process so that they can learn from the mistakes and they can also be part of the process to be able to write that wrong. Jim is working on the, the blurriness there to make it more focused. I'm glad that wasn't my eyes. Amen. Uh, <laughs> just so you know some um, comments about restorative justice um, I was a dean for about seven years at uh, another high school. And uh, I wish we had this uh, back in the you know, early 2000s. Um, this would really have helped a lot of kids uh, during that time. Um, the way we used to deem during that time is basically it's a script book. You do this, you're sus suspended for so many days. You do this, you get your, your in-school suspended so many days. It really doesn't go to the root issue why I did what I did. Um, it didn't take into consideration the individual what they're going through, what their home life is going through, um, uh, what's going on in their life. That's the real critical issues. What's really the root issue that you act that way, that you, you threw that, you know, uh, the chair uh, or you got in a fight or you stole. There's issues behind that. And, and, and it's just, um, it's good for everyone. It's good for education to, to start thinking in, in, in that manner. We've, we've, it's, it's, it's evolving. It wasn't always like that. So that's why we're so proud of this uh, restorative justice uh, program. We've been trying to get it in the books for a while now, and, and, and it's final is here. Uh, Mr. Castro and Mr. Mayor, let's really um, push forward through that, as well as Yovan and uh, Eileen. Yeah, I was reading up on it uh, before the meeting, and it discussed how um, it, it really, what it does is it, it also focuses on uh, reconciliation um, with with the the victims, you know, right. the, the, yeah, and it connects it connects the victim with the perpetrator or the person that dealt the the wrong, and it, it almost like connects them in a way that say, hey, this is what happened to me. Okay, I understand. It's 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 interesting. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. This is Pedro Castro and Jason Madel, deans over at Fenton High School. We want to talk with you this evening about FHS's restorative justice equity journey. Before we go into the journey, just wanted to give you an overview of our presentation. We'll be talking about some background data, some background, some data, and some research. Uh, we'll talk about what is restorative justice. How does restorative uh -huh. justice look at Fenton? We're also going to illustrate our equity journey through the use of restorative justice practices. Before we go into the actual presentation, I would like for you to consider this. The Alliance for Education published a report in 2013 which indicated a ninth grader who is suspended once increase, increase is two times more likely to drop out. 
So in other words, if a ninth grader is suspended from school one time, he increases the ability for that student to drop out of school from 16 to 32 percent. A second suspension for that ninth grader increases the risk of dropping out from 16 to 42 percent. So for this reason, we think about alternatives to suspension. We want to be able to keep students in the building when it's safe and when it's doable. So, uh, so here you have some statistics for uh, kind of discipline, kind of discipline over the last nine yeah, years, 2010 through 2019. I do want to highlight, which is highlighted there for 16 and 17 school year. In January of 2016, Senate Bill 100 went into effect. Yeah, so Although we started implementing some of Senate Bill 100 requirements in the fall of 2016, um, it was fully implemented, uh, at least the requirements of the, the bill in 2016 and 2017. So as far as traditional discipline, I just want to explain what is that. So we here at Fenton use a traditional discipline system that was rooted in rules-based, uh, punitive, managerial, authoritative approach, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, that did not incorporate student input in terms of writing the wrong. I did want to make a distinction between student input here and student input as it relates to due process. When we talk about due process, students are in the dean's office for uh, a violation of a school policy or a violation of something that has not gone um, well or didn't go as a student planned. So we want student input uh, as far as learning what happened, their point of view, that's due process. This student input talks more about righting a wrong. We want students to be be involved in the process so that they can learn from the mistakes and they can also they be, can part, also of be part of the process to, process be, able to, to be able to write that wrong. So second point here is that a uh, quote from Urban Urban, student accountability student. fails in a system monitor that student input is important for student accountability. Uh, without this opportunity, the behavior of the harm is repeated. because the root or the initial concern has not been addressed. And this board, if, is it okay? We're having technical difficulties. If we got to do due justice to this great presentation, it's so important for the district. We get Jim, let's, let's, we let's get pass this to, to the next board meeting. Uh, Mr. Castro and, and Mr. Madel has done an outstanding job here. Hopefully we can figure out uh, the technical difficulties next time. Uh, a little bit disappointed that it's it, we can't view this at this time, uh, but we we got to give this due diligence in a fair shake. Um, if that if that's okay with you, President Wiedemann, let's postpone this. This is really a great topic for uh, for our equity topic here. I I think that's a good idea. Let's just table it for uh, hopefully uh, in the next meeting, because otherwise we're not doing good. Forward it to us, or could you? We'll do that as well. We'll do that as well. But if we could also present okay. it to, um, to the board, I think the audience should also see that as well, uh, as, as well as our stakeholders. Very good. Yeah. yeah. Does it table it? Require a vote? It was on the agenda. Say it again. It uh, wasn't an action item. Require an action item. I'm sorry, I used the wrong. Okay. We could just postpone it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um. Hopefully this one is a little better. This is also a video presentation. Uh, it's ramp. Uh, let's take a couple minutes uh, to, to. We'll take a look at it and uh, we'll 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 delay it if um, if the technology doesn't cooperate as well. Uh, basically, this is a an update from our assistant principal uh, in regards to our counseling department. Jim. Good evening. Today our goal is to provide you Today. with an overview of the counseling program. My name is Eileen Roberts and I'm the assistant principal. Counselors have begun to do work Counselor through the ASCA standards, the American School Counseling Association curriculum. School our goal and objective is to align our work with the ASCA standards. This program sets up our team to work from mindsets and behaviors that mm. will in turn be the daily work we do with students. Hey. As we continue to learn about the requirements that ASCA sets forth, we will continue to share it's all right if it's postponed. We're having technical difficulties here. 
Yeah, let's do that. When we, yeah, just postpone it because otherwise, you know, we need to see it. That is it for the info informational item, President Wiedemann. Okay, thank you. Then we'll look forward to those presentations at the, at the uh, next meeting. So we'll move on to the um, consent agenda. Does anyone have any questions regarding any items on the consent agenda? Nope. All right, if not, then may I, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved. Thank you. Second. Was it Juliet? Yeah. And may I have a second, please? Second. All right, Marianne. thank you, Marianne. Roll call, please. Wait, no. Yes. Yellowick? Figueroa? Yes. Rago? Yes. Ramirez? Yes. Ting Pong? -Pong? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. And I did I did see Patty Gallowick shake as a yes. <laughs> so yes. Okay. Okay, great. Motion has passed. Uh, next item is the, on the is the discussion action items, the 2020 tax levy group. I believe that is yours. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Wiederman. Um, if I become blurry, just stop me, folks, and I'll start. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, that was a joke, so don't take them personally. Uh, I just wanted to uh, recap the tax levy from, from last month. Um, we presented the tentative levy, uh, estimated levy at the last board meeting, October 21st. Um, and the 2020 levy uh, numbers were presented at that time. We recommended, and that is unchanged from October to November, that it is, uh, we're recommending a 4.99% increase. And that's over uh, and above what the 2019 extension was. Um, we are within the 5%, so there's no need to have a, a public um, uh, hearing. So uh, that is, does not have to take place. Um, and again, as I said, it's unchanged from October. Um, and that's because we, we levy more than the uh, CPI uh, rate of inflation. We're entitled to at least 2.3% plus new property. We're not sure if there's any other growth there that we're not aware of. So that's why we kind of put a little bit of a buffer there to make sure we can capture everything uh, the district's legally uh, entitled to. So um, we're asking the board to take some action tonight to approve uh, the levy resolutions presented uh, before you tonight. And um, once that uh, is acted upon, um, the documents will be filed um, as required with the Cook County, or excuse me, DuPage County Clerk's Office. Um, so with that, I'll uh, answer any questions that you may have. Um, how long does it take to, like if say we wanted to apply for a larger levy? Um, for construction or whatever. How long does that process take? Or how soon, it, how long in advance we need to start that ball? Well, part of it, um, if we had authority from the voters where we were successful with a referendum, for example, uh, depending on when that happened, um, there are uh, periods of time where you can amend your levy. So um, if, it, if it happened, uh, you know, after the levy had already been adopted, let's just say we you know, had a successful referendum and in January we were successful and, and um, were able to extend, adjust our levy, we could amend it um, before the final levy were to be extended. Don't quote me on the exact times, but there, there are some provisions where you can amend your levy in between uh, the time that it's adopted and before it's, the final extension occurs. Does that answer your question, Patty? Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks. Thank you, Patty. Um, then if there are no further questions, may I have a motion that the Board of Education adopts the following 2020 tax levy resolutions 
and certificates as presented. The resolution authorizing final aggregate tax levy for the year 2020. The resolution authorizing and directing certain special purpose tax levies for the year 2020. And the certificate of compliance with uh, truth and taxation law. I'll make the motion, Paul. All right, thank you, Marianne. May I have a second? I'll second. Okay, thank you, Jackie. Roll call, please. Peyton Howell? Yes. So moved. Figueroa? Yes. Rago? Yes. Ramirez? Yes. King Paul Palm? Yes. Jalowick? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. All right, uh, has passed. Now we move to the shared services report. And Bruce, that is yours too. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Wiedemann. Um, this is our uh, annual report on shared services or outsourcing that the school district uh, in, in, engages in. Um, so, and this is per Illinois school code. Um, we adopt this every year, the board does. Um, so the shared services report, and it's part of the annual financial report and our audit as well. So this would be for the fiscal year ending June 30th of 2020. Um, and it, as it says in the report there, it is part of the AFR um, that our auditors uh, review as well. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, the intent is really to, to display and, and convey um, all of the um, collaborative agreements we have, whether it's our one of our feeder elementary districts or insurance cooperatives, uh, village uh, collaborations, that type of thing. So it's listed on that second page, as I said, as part of the um, AFR, annual financial report as well, and the uh, various uh, services that we engage in are, are listed on that report. Um, so as required, we present this to the board. We'll post it after the board approves it um, on our website, and uh, we will be in compliance for another year. All right, any uh, questions for Bruce? All right, then may I have a motion that the Board of Education approves the report on shared services for outsourcing for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2020. I'll make the motion. The tweet. Okay, thank you, Jackie. May I have a second? I have a second, Paul. Okay, thank you, Mary Ann. Roll call, please, Mary. Peyton Ho? Yes. Rago? Yes. Ramirez? Yes. King Paul Pong? Yes. Jalowick? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. All right, the motion has passed. We move on to the committee reports. Uh, Juliet and Kit, anything on the Bensonville Community Foundation? Or the. Um, I mean, do you have anything to add, Kit? Do you have anything? Uh, to add? You know, we, we did have the meeting um, last week and. Um, we don't have anything to report as far as new business that I can recall. Um, we, we did welcome our, our new, uh, secretary <laughs> who, who, who did a, a beautiful job in, in, uh, stepping in. So that was, that was one, which is, which is, uh, Juliet. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, we should really say we should talk about Monica, right? Oh, oh sure. Yeah. Um, so she's our uh, she's working on the uh, partly the finance uh, she's a finance assistant. So she, you know, she's a graduate of Penn, second year finance student, and so um, she's getting some experience. Um, looking at the on the finance side, which is the treasurer side of the of the foundation, so it's pretty good experience for her. She's been really exceptional to work with. 
So you better be a good teacher, Kit. Mm. Oh, my, the intention is to do my best, yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> Pressure's on. All right, great. Thank you, uh, Kit. Thank you, Juliet. Um, the Finance Committee, right now we do not have anything unless you have something, Marianne. No, thank you. I do not. Okay. Uh, IASB delegate, I did attend the 2020 delegate assembly meeting on November uh, 14th. Um, all of the non binding resolutions that we had discussed at the last meeting uh, were adopted, that were adopted by the resolutions committee, um, did pass and were uh, adopted or not adopted as we discussed at the meeting. So they all went. Uh, the way that we had agreed to. Um, so the, the meeting was short. It was approximately only 40 minutes, which is a lot shorter than other years. Um, so, uh, but Fenton was uh, represented and voted uh, at that, uh, was present at that meeting. And, um, and that's all I have really for the IASB delegate. Um, <coughs> Lend, um, does anyone have anything to report for Lend? Nope. The meeting is going to be taking place this coming Friday. This Friday. Okay. All right. Then we maybe we'll have something on the next meeting. Uh, NEDSEC, Leo, and Patty. Well, I was attending the meeting, so it was James that uh, more or less we find out about the replacement uh, for the financial advisor that uh, she is leaving, and we more or less have a virtual view of the classroom at Lincoln. So far, it's really well maintained and uh, properly, uh, I'm going to say, financially responsible for the people that are taking care and they are doing a great job. Okay. All right, thank you, Leo. Um, and the policy committee, I mean, yeah, there's nothing new there unless Patty or Kid, do you have anything to add? I don't think no, there's nothing. At our policy. Right now. Okay. All right, thank you. Next board meeting, next virtual board meeting is Wednesday, uh, December 16th at 2020, 2020 at 7 p.m. Uh, so that will be our next meeting. Then we move on to closed session. We have a motion and a second to go into closed session for the purpose of the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the public body or legal counsel for the public body, including hearing testimony on a complaint lodged against an employee of the public body or against legal counsel for the public body to determine its validity. However, a meeting to consider an increase in compensation to a specific employee of a public body that is subject to the local government wage increase transparency act may not be closed and shall be open to the public and posted and held in accordance with this act, 5 ILCS 120-2C1, and collective negotiating matters between the public body and its, and its employees or their representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees under 5 ILCS 120-2C2. I make a motion. Okay, thank you, Go Patty. May I second? I'll second. Okay, thank you, Jackie. Roll call, please, Mary. Peyton Howell? Yes. Ramirez? Yes. Ting Po Pong? Yes. Jalowit? Yes. Figueroa? Leo, you're on mute. 
I'm sorry. Yes. Rego? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. Okay, we will be in closed session. Jim, if you could let us know when, when we're in closed session. Passed and Jim, let us know when we're back in open session. Ready to go. Okay, we are back in open session. May I have a motion and a second to adjourn? I'll make a motion that we adjourn. Thank you, Jackie. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Kit. Roll call, please, Mary. Peyton Hall. Yes. Galloway. Yes. Figueroa. Leo, Leo turn, your on. Mic on. turn your mic on. You're on mute, Leo. Mute. Yes. Oh, Rigo? Yes. Ramirez? Yes. King Po Pong? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. All right, everyone, have a good night. Stay safe. We'll see you next time. Any questions, let me know. You too. Thank you.